Dune Part 2 is the follow-up, of course, to uh, Dune, Denis Villeneuve's most recent film. Uh, it stars Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides, the rumored hero of the galaxy, right? The potential messiah, at least according to his mother, the Lady Jessica, played brilliantly by Rebecca Ferguson. Uh, Paul and Jessica are stranded on Arrakis following the events of Dune 1. Uh, they have no friends. They have all enemies. Uh, the, the, the galaxy believes them dead. The Emperor and the Harkonnens, of course, who have betrayed them, thinks them to be gone. And they unite with the Fremen and Chani, played by Zendaya, who, uh, of course, Timothy Chalamet's character Paul has a bit of a thing for. Uh, and they hope that maybe uh, they can come together and retake Arrakis for the Fremen and maybe even get a spot in, in the holy war and and perhaps prevent the terrible tragedy that paul is having through these visions and ultimately as they keep moving towards what's next paul has to ch face a choice between the love of his life and the fate of the known universe the movie is dune 2 it is two hours and 46 minutes it is big visuals andy what did you think Man, so I was really blown away visually. Uh, I mean, it's incredible sci-fi, and it goes even bigger than the first film. We have uh, the big fights. We have the big sandworms. We we have so much going on. I was a little underwhelmed by the drama. I wasn't as captivated by the first one. Um, I think maybe there's too there's a little too much going on by the third act. It feels a little rushed. There's kind of too many characters, and it, it just kind of lacked the 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 drama that that i wanted it is growing on me and i think oh i think maybe on second watch i'll probably like it a lot more that tends tends to happen when i'm kind of anxious about w what the story is going um but it's still it, it's an incredible experience incredible sights and, and sounds uh i think that the narrative isn't quite as compelling as, as in the first film but incredible incredible win for cinema this weekend Andy called it in our open here when we were talking about the box office. Dune 2 is event cinema. It is something people are telling their friends about and turning out for. You are going to see it on the biggest screen possible if you can. You want to go see it some more with big speakers. You want to be taken away to the planet of Arrakis. And I think that's something Villeneuve manages to genuinely accomplish in feeling and tone here like dune 2 feels like you are on another planet and i keep hearing people say that and it's it's hard to suss out what exactly that means here in the review but the commitment to visual style the commitment to the world the commitment to shooting on location and if you're not shooting on location you're shooting with the best effects possible the commitment to costuming production design character design adaptation from the text which i haven't read but i hear is wildly difficult to adapt Adapt, right? David Lynch wrestled with it in the past. Alejandro Hodorowski wrestled with it in the past. The commitment to shooting the film in digital and converting it to 35 millimeter film and then converting it back to digital so you get a more genuine, tangible feel. All of this adds up to an experience that is unique, that nobody else is doing at the cinema. Villeneuve, I think, has managed to expand the vocabulary with which we tell sci-fi stories. People like Star Wars, right? People. Companies. Corporations like Disney, the people who make Star Wars, they could take a big lesson from this. I really think so. Like the work he's done with his director of photography, uh, the work he's doing with his actors, it, it genuinely feels unmatched. There are a few experiences like it. It's hard to say where we get started talking about this, Andy, because we're not going to talk about spoilers. We don't do spoilers on this podcast. That's not what we do. But I think the visuals are a great place. Yeah, like I was saying before, you have uh, you set up for some big events. We know at, at kind of at the end of, of Dune One that Paul will eventually ride the 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 sandworms, and and we have a big scene of of where he eventually does that at Mount. And we also see there's a lot of big battles. There there's fights with the uh, the Harkonnen sand. I keep wanting to say sand crawlers, which is from <laughs> from Star Wars. Uh, harvesters, sand uh, spice harvesters. Um, and it, there's a lot of visuals from the trailer that, that we don't really know about or don't really know how it plays in. We also have uh, Austin Butler's character, Fade Rotha, um, who we see in this kind of gladiatorial match and, and some really interesting scenes. It's just the, the scale of it. It looks so real. Like they're shooting out in the desert on the dunes. They're they're making, you know, they're not CGI in the suits like they do in a lot of like superhero stuff. Like they're making practical things for them to wear. And it just really draws you into the world. 
Yeah, and I love the way Frasier manages to shoot space. Like, I think Villeneuve has this too. Not space like out in outer space. I mean space across distances, right? Like you can have Paul Atreides standing in the foreground raising his knife to rally the Fremen and you can have thousands of Fremen in the background and the camera's focused all the way out on them because they're what's important in that moment. Like the the commitment to you seeing things across vast distances on the planet of Arrakis like creates a sense of scale between our subjects and the things they're the, 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 the problems they are dealing with and also like builds the world to feel unique additionally uh, the technology in dunes feels so uniquely its own when anybody hovers in this movie it is the coolest looking thing and it's literal puppetry it's people on wires but you're so invested in what's happening that you don't care the music by Hans Zimmer is tremendous and I didn't actually know this uh, the whole reason Zimmer didn't do Oppenheimer is because he's a huge dune head apparently he read it in the 70s and loved it and he's always wanted to do it so he's in for these movies because he just likes them he just wants to be a part of it I think a lot of people who are in these movies like are just generally genuinely engaged in working with Villeneuve and being a part of the text the cast list shows you got every, everybody from Christopher Walken to Florence Pugh it's nuts how many people are in this stuff people just want to be a part of this, what feels like great movement to be in Dune. And one of the things that's really crazy about it, I think, maybe the craziest, is that the plot is so uniquely complex that <laughs> if you were to talk about a little bit of it on Twitter, people would have no idea what you were saying. You know, you could talk about Paul becoming the Lisan al Gaib, and people are like, what, what yeah. does that mean, <laughs> right? Like nothing. Yeah. Like, it's, it's impossible to, to, be, to spoil. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's gibberish to people who haven't seen it. So like going to see Dune is being invited into the tent of Dune, right? Like you, you have become a Dune head like the rest of us. And it's also uniquely isolating for other pieces of media a la Star Wars, right? Like I've seen people comparing Dune to Star Wars. Oh, the Harkonnens are like the Empire and Arrakis is like uh, uh, Tatooine. And people did that with Dune 1. But Dune 1 spent so much more time building a universe. Dune 2 already has one. And I think that may be a place where some people have left a little wayward because it doesn't have it doesn't quite give you as much fun like setting up all of these magic tricks for you to see really you just see the execution of them in a place we've already been and with these big visions paul is having he's fearing this future that may be coming and then as the movie continues to roll towards what it seems that future is going to be it can feel a little bit like it's on tracks maybe 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 just saying for some all right <laughs> and uh i don't know i i i, I think I think I've, from people I've heard who said it was like, all right, I think that was maybe the biggest, the biggest point of, of critique. Yeah, I, I've, I saw it with someone who had read the book. I've read a third of Dune because <laughs> I have, because I can't focus this enough to read, to read. Um, and they said, yeah, they were a little disappointed in kind of how it ended. It, the, it just leaves out a lot of the political intrigue and political kind of philosophy that's going on. It's meant to be kind of a cautionary tale kind of the dangers of, of religious fanaticism and like Messiah worship. Um, it doesn't totally come across uh, in the film, uh, but I wanted to get into our, our plot a, a little bit. So we, we find Timothy Chalamet, Paul Atreides among the, the Fremen. Uh, he befriends uh, Zendaya, Zendaya's character, Chani. They develop a relationship. He, he slowly, uh, at his initial... He's initially resistant to the idea of that he's the chosen one. Everyone thinks he kind of is, and he's like, "No, that's I, I don't believe in that. That's just propaganda." Uh, but people like like Javier Bardem, Bardem Stilgar, who was weirdly the comic relief of this movie, even though he wasn't in the first movie. Charmingly, um, I think, he, but yes, he is. He's yeah. a laugh for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, he he's totally convinced, and that's widely what this war is that they eventually kind of wage. Uh, a guerrilla war against the Harkonnens, but part of the war is also philosophical. It, it's it's implant continuing to build the myth of Paul of Trades that that he is the Lisan Al Gaib and a bunch of other names that basically Absolutely. is a messiah figure that that's going to bring yeah bring uh, peace and prosperity to uh, to the Fremen and 
and again, so it's his journey about going from now I don't believe this to kind of believing his his own BS. Uh, and then we also see a big difference in Rebecca Ferguson's character, uh, Lady Jessica, who um, in the first film, she's like, uh, careful, Paul, like, you know, there, there's this prophecy but it's kind of i don't know i don't we should we don't shouldn't get really and then in this one she's she's totally into it she's like no he my son he's the savior i'm the reverend mother i'm gonna convince like we're good and like and she's it's it's funny because she starts dressing completely different like her her um costuming is way more elaborate she's got the face the cool face tattoos totally drinking the punch and selling it to any anyone who will listen so so we find uh this kind of internal struggle happening as they also kind of try to fight their way way back and eventually try to challenge the the emperor for the for the throne i'm not super sold on the the romance great theme by hans zimmer uh, on between uh paul paul and chani but it it i just didn't really buy it very much zende is great though she she really does a lot of she's got very powerful eyes it's a little like it's a little very like strong emoting Zen. It's a little like, and, and I don't mean to stick this on Zendaya because I'm not, but it's a little like watching Zendaya and like Tom Holland and Spider-Man. You're like, yeah, of course. You guys are like the trendy actors and you're going to be, you know, it's the script. It's the way it is. Like, yeah, the, the chemistry's fine, I guess. But regardless of that, like, I think the way their relationship unfolds, especially thematically on screen, uh, via even like color theory, right? This like blue bandana she wears. Like, I think that stuff is really valuable. And Vill Villeneuve had an early interesting point. I was watching an interview. He said that a lot of the women in the picture um, are kind of the moral tent poles for Paul because he is wandering in the desert in this movie. Like he is looking for the answers. He's trying to figure out if he is a part of the Fremen. He does not seem to believe in this prophecy, but he keeps having these nightmares about it, that it's going to happen and he can't get away from it. It's just the way it's going to be. It's growing to like find this acceptance of this, of this future that like maybe you don't love, but you benefit from. And then the idea that it might even be real in the first place. Like all, all of those make for really complicated themes. And Stilgar is a great laugh. Like uh, Javier Bardem, listen, my man's got talent. He can do drama. He can do comedy. He can do drama. He can do Dune <laughs> too. And the idea of him being like, this section of the the leader of this kind of section of the Fremen who are devout believers, right? Like functionally evangelicals who say no matter what this person does, they are the Messiah. Even if they say they're not, they're just being humble. They must be the Messiah. Like it's 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 religious fanaticism. And that's like a fascinating thing for a sci-fi epic to genuinely try to tackle. Star Wars has done it a bit. I mean, you could even look at the Jedi as religious fanatics, right? Or believers in them, but never on this level, especially with a, 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 a protagonist who doesn't necessarily want that future for themselves or for anybody else. It's unique and it challenges you and it challenges you in your seat to, to think of how you think of protagonists and what that means to you for a hero to be a hero whether or not our characters are doing the right or wrong thing is kind of fascinating in this movie and the way characters draw towards paul and then additionally away from him as he moves through the plot of dune 2 is kind of fascinating and one of the things i'm really looking forward to watching again not to mention of course the harkonnens who have a whole rad planet with all kinds of weird stuff going on god i, I heard they shot the harkonnen planet in infrared and black and white. Greg Frazier worked that out, and that's why it looks so cool. And Paul, like uh, Austin Butler's the baldest bald you can be, uh, and he's nuts. <laughs> like I don't know, man. Like all, all that stuff, like just draws me right in. It is. It's a long runtime, which I didn't mind. If anything, you know, I, I I liked seeing it. And I went and saw it on the same screen Andy did. Biggest IMAX we got in town, which was a great time. Um, and also you you mentioned it, but Hans Zimmer's definitely getting the best score nom for this, right? Like for sure. This is. I can already see yeah, Oscars 2025. They're going to be playing this music. Yeah, like it's great. It's it's a great score. I've been listening through it. It might it might go on the my continually growing uh, play, Spotify playlist um, yeah. of film soundtracks. I, do, I wanted to also mention we we have uh, performances by Florence Pugh and Christopher Walken um, in kind of underused roles. They're not in the movie very much. I really feel they're a little wasted. That I I remember reading that Florence Pugh. Um, Denny Villeneuve wanted her, but he he was also like, it's not a big role. I understand if you say no, it's totally fine. And she was like, no, I absolutely want to work with you. I just want to see how you work, even if it's for a short amount of time. Um, yeah. uh, Leia Sidhu is also in this. In this, there's a lot. The cast has grown from a big cast already, and you get the problem where you don't have as much screen time because you have so many people uh, to kind of keep up with. 
It's true. Yeah, I, I, I thought about that most of the way through the movie. I'm like, I'm pretty sure Timothy Chalamet has one outfit for this entire picture. Maybe like two, maybe like a slightly dustier sand suit, but like he's functionally not physically changing a lot because the movie has to bounce around to so many different places and who's going on with what. And I think in that way, like, I do want to speak towards adaptation a little. I'm out of my element because I haven't read the original, so it's hard for me to say whether or not it's a good adaptation. But coming at it from the from the theater side, right, having only just seen the previous film and walking into this, like, I feel like it does a really good job of adapting whatever's in the page, like on the page to the screen. I know I haven't read what's on the page, but like it seems very complete. And I've heard people say Dune is unfilmable. So like for what it's worth, if 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 this if the standard is unfilmable, like this certainly blows past that, at least at the box office. Like people believe in this. People believe in what's going on here. And I think it's a good thing. Like I, I think it's good for cinema. I uh God, I don't know if I can say much more without getting into spoilers, but I don't know. I, I like this movie challenges you thematically. I like that it pushes visuals. I like that it pushes the boundaries of like what people have come to expect from sci-fi. I hope other sci-fi films take a similar approach. Like I was thinking just earlier today about other escapist sci-fi we've seen in the last year. And yeah, you get some big stuff that I really like, like, I don't know, a recent Cronenberg feature, but like you also get Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania and that's like got a protagonist who's like escaped to a faraway place and has to figure out how to get out, right? And it's like so drastically different in tone. And the budgets aren't all that different. So like, I don't I don't know, man. I think Villeneuve's got something cooking here. I think he should probably take a, one off before he does the next one because I think the next one's all but confirmed. I'm running out of things to say, Andy. Uh, any other thoughts on Dune 2 before recommendations? I think I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend Dune Part 2? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a huge cinema event, follow up to the 2021 first film, uh, I think, done very well, incredible visuals, incredible score, incredible event uh, filmmaking. I felt the the, the narrative gut falls a little short in, in the end, or it just kind of becomes a little safe. I feel like no one really uh, comes up against really any obstacles or setbacks. Um, but overall, it works so well, and and it's great to see. You know, we were comparing this to Star Wars b before, and I think one of the things with Dune is like the movie has to succeed. You you can't depend on the parks or the toys or any of that. It has to be all about the movie itself. So you got to make great cinema, and it has. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Uh, huge thumbs up for Dune Part Two. I don't know if that'll be my favorite movie of the year. People have asked me that. They're like, so Dune Two. Favorite movie of 2024? I'm like, oh, we'll pop the brakes, kid. My favorite movie last year might have been Alexander Payne's The Holdovers. So, like, let's not let's not rush to what's the best and the worst. But for what's here, like, I think it's genuinely an accomplishment. Like the fact that the fact that Villeneuve can continue to call his shot and then exceed expectations at this level is bonkers. Like, there's a reason him and Chris Nolan are taking photos together now because people are like, this guy is approaching this level. It's crazy. It's crazy. I think Dune 2 is an accomplishment. I think Dune 2 is challenging. I think Dune 2 isn't for everybody. And I think over time, people will probably slide it into kind of a uh, Two Towers, Empire Strikes Back kind of role, like a bridge film, part of a whole, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, part one, maybe. Even though that's really one of two, part one and part two. But you hear me. I, I think I think in the future, there will be a Blu-ray box set of the three Dune movies, right? That'll be the thing, or however many of these they're going to end up doing. And I think this one will pair nicely with what's there on its own. I think it's strong. Together, it's even stronger. That's Dune 2. There it is. Oh my gosh, we got through it. That seems so intimidating. And now we're on the other side of it. And now we get to talk about something really exciting from Warner Brothers, the people who made Dune 2, and how they're spending way too much money in a new segment. Well, it's the same old segment, but a segment that we like to call, Andy, go for it, please. It's time for the death of cinema. <laughs> 